Hey there, welcome to Cloud and Sec, your cloud and cybersecurity tech channel on YouTube. In this video, I'm going to talk about strategic news related to cybersecurity that came out last month. By strategic, I mean news that are going to be relevant for the upcoming months. Top of mind news related to people, processes, and technology. Let's dive in. Okay, let's start off by just talking about where you can find all the sources and links for everything I'm going to be talking about here. This is my blog post. As you can see, this is my blog post. I'm going to put the link into the description. This is the strategic cybersecurity report for June 2023. Okay, let's start off by people, by people related news. So first of all is a new attack uh, that leverages hallucination in uh, major LLM AIs in the, in the market. So as reported by Vulcan, this is a research by this cybersecurity company. Um, they are asking us the question, can you trust HPD's package recommendation? So this is a very targeted kind of question to large language models. It makes us wonder if our developers and our um, software engineering teams are leveraging this open source LLM models that are um, oftentimes not tweaked properly for software development. We know, as we know, it's been widely reported that they can hallucinate or they can create false information as if it was true. Um, so attackers are large leveraging or they can leverage that be specific behavior to create malicious packages and have them publicly accessible for naive and otherwise unknowingly developers who utilize these LLMs. So how does this attacker happen according to the research? Now I'm gonna leave the, the, the link here for the entire and official research for you. It's a very thorough document and they're gonna go through uh, most of everything I'm talking about here in details. They even have a POC, proof of concept for it, but what I want to draw our attention to today is really just a description that they came up with for the diagram of this attack or threat modeling this attack really, right? So when we think of attackers, they could use these open um, LLM models to pose questions related to software package when they see a non-existent package being responded from the LLM model, they publish malicious packages utilizing that non-existent recommendation by the uh, by the open model in a public package or repository. So imagine you are a Python developer, you uh, utilize that package for your piece of software, and this was recommended by your LLM. And so this is what happened. The attacker created this malicious package and put it, put it in public package repository your user or software developer would then pose a similar question that would get this uh, answer with this non-existent or fake package. Now, what I haven't seen here is the conditions upon which the LLM is actually gonna hallucinate at the same rate or with the same answers that the that it will do for the attacker, right? So what is the frequency of similar um, looking non-existent recommendations made by the LLM, Un unsure what is the likelihood of this actually happening in the field, unsure as well. But uh, as the user receives that non-existent uh, package recommendation, the malicious package that was injected by the attacker, they're gonna install that and potentially be um, susceptible for that piece of attack. It's a very narrow and specific kind of scenario, but it's a great example of for us to think about how our teams, internal teams, are leveraging these public models. We have to have understanding of all the potential risks and threats that exist by using these models. When we otherwise utilize tools that are um, perfect, perfected and created, curated for specific use cases, we know that we have a better assurance of their ability to respond properly as expected. Right, so that's something to keep in mind. That's the first story of the month here for me. Now, this, this has been also reported by other outlets such as Dark Reading, as you can see here on the screen. And I will leave these doc, these links for you to read uh, later on. 
Now moving on, the next um, the next news that I brought along was related to Microsoft releasing what it calls the Cyber Signals Report, issue number four. Um, so that's the fourth iteration of the Cyber Signals Report, in which they highlight uh, findings from the Microsoft Threat Intelligence field related to business email compromise and phishing seen on the field. Uh, as you can see here, the headline is Shifting Tactics Fuel Sur Surge in Business Email Compromise. So they are widely co cooperating uh, with FBI, with CISA, to find even more information about this year. Uh, but what Microsoft has observed is an increase in sophistication and tactics by threat actors specializing in BC, business email compromise, including leveraging residential internet protocol or IP addresses to make attack campaigns appear locally generated. Uh, so this new tactic is helping criminals further monetize cybercrime as a service and has caught federal law enforcement attention because it allows cybercriminals to evade impossible travel alerts used to identify and block anomalous login attempts and other suspicious account activity. This is very concerning because oftentimes we, from the defensive side of things, we propose um, these alerts and we rely on these alerts to understand where there are risky uh, logins or risky anomalous login attempts coming from, right? Because we're looking at IP addresses that uh, their attackers are utilizing. So then how they're leveraging this as cyber as a crime, as part of their cyber as a cyber crime as a service, it's very important to understand. Now, uh, important statistics that came out of here from this report, I'm going to let you the full report to read later, but important highlights here. Microsoft Digital Crime Units has observed a 38% increase in cyber crime as a service. <laughs> The highlight here, one of the highlights that I'm going to leave you with the report, and I will give you the link for you to access it fully later on, naturally. But one of the highlights is that Microsoft's Digital Crimes Unit has observed a 38% increase in cybercrime as a service, targeting business email between 2019 and 2022. So it's a very uh, significant increase in cybercrime as a service, targeting business email. Now, looking from a threat perspective, they make a, a report here about specific campaigns utilizing this technique, including uh, phishing as a service, uh, such as evil proxy, naked pages, and caffeine to deploy phishing campaigns that obtain compromised credentials. They then talk about how s some cybercrime as a service tools, such as Bulletproof Link here, uh, offers the centralized gateway design which includes this internet computer public blockchain nodes to host phishing and BEC sites, right? So creating this sophisticated decentralized web offering that's much harder to disrupt from our side, from the defense side of things. I highly recommend you read through this thoroughly, but what I want to leave you with is the business email compromise phishing image here by mail type. So as you can see here, the business email compromise phishing mail by type here indicates that uh, there's a lot of business email compromise here targeting using the, to the lure uh, phishing mail type here, right? Some leverage payroll, some leverage invoice, but more than half here leverage the lure, um, what Microsoft calls lure category. And by the end of the report, as I scroll down, we can see recommendations that are left from Microsoft, which is uh, largely the cybersecurity industry recommendations as well, right? So what can we do as defenders to mitigate these risks, maximize security settings, protecting your inbox, right? So this is very important. So raise your fences, uh, then set up strong authentication, right? To not merely rely on uh, single factor authentication that's very important utilize strong authentication types not just sms not just um, simple uh, code generated from uh, an application but rather uh, number matching authentication and so on and so forth even passwordless if possible lastly train your employees right 
leverage the tools that Microsoft and many other vendors provide to you from an attack simulation campaign capabilities, right? So leverage that, educate your employees, train them accordingly, and reduce your risk. There's also the uh, proposal of other ways to defend against attacks, utilizing proper email validation, such as DMARC is very important as well, to reject uh, spoofed messages from attackers, and there's other recommendations here as well. Now, I'm going to leave you this, this report for further consumption, and this is a very good look into the insights here of Microsoft Threat Intelligence. Next news is related to EU AI regulation, right? So in Europe, uh, the EU, EU AI Act um, is the first regulation on artificial intelligence. So this is essentially uh, one of the first ways to try and regulate AI based on their use, right? And this has been long coming, right? So since April 2021, the European Commission proposed the first EU um, European Union regulatory framework for AI. It says that AI systems that can be used in different applications are analyzed and classified according to the risk they pose to users. So this is a good approach, right? So you're looking at what kind of data and their processing and what kind of risk does that kind of AI poses to users. So the different risk levels will mean more or less regulation. Once approved, this will be the world's first rules on AI. That's very hard, right? So we know that we need to regulate AI. We need to regulate how we're using AI. And you taking that step is something positive from my perspective. Now, what have they um, stated so far in terms of different rules for different risk levels? They are proposed there are different rules and obligations to AI providers based on the level of risk related to how they are treating or what data they're treating in their AI models. Um, so there are there is an acceptable risk. So AI systems that are considered a threat to people will be banned according to this act. So what do they include? They include cognitive behavior manipulation of people or specific vulnerable groups. So voice activated toys that encourage dangerous behavior in children. Another unacceptable risk is social scoring, classifying people based on behavior, social economic status, or personal characteristics. And lastly, real-time or remote biometric identification systems such as facial recognition. Now, we already see some of these uses uh, in parts of the world, right? Um, so this is a little bit Black Mirror, but unfortunately, it's already been deployed in parts of the world. Hopefully, this act can catch on other parts of the world and be approved to regulate and curb the use of AI in this case is there. Now, they also classify in high risk. So what's included in high risk AI systems according to this proposal? So essentially these eight categories here, uh, they will have to registered uh, in an EU database, biometric identification and categorization of natural persons, management and operation of critical infrastructure, education and vocational training, employment, worker management and access of self-deployment, uh, access to and enjoyment of essential private services, law enforcement, migration, uh, border control, assistance in legal interpretation and application of the law. So we already see a lot of these use cases falling into public open LLM models currently. Um, they already have databases that are able to provide some assistance in legal inter interpretation or application of the law, for example. But then uh, moving forward, once this is approved, all high-risk AI systems will be assessed before being put on the market, right? And also throughout our life cycle. So that's, that's that there. Now there's generative AI as well. So where this uh, generative AI like ChatGPT fall under this new act. They have to comply with the transparency uh, requirements, such as disclosing the content that was generated by AI. So this is something very important as well. A lot of the major tech companies are already looking into how to validate the content created by AI. 
Microsoft made announcements last month, Google as well, about how they are creating ways to validate content created by their AI models. They are also looking at designing the model to prevent it from generating illegal content. There's a lot of that out there as well in terms of controlling that. Uh, that comes down to good prompt engineering on the back end, right? Creating proper controls on top of these models. And naturally publishing summaries of, of copyrighted data used for training. So this is incredibly important from a copyright perspective. We have seen the backlash that um, in image generating AI models that have been trained with copyrighted data has created amongst artists, be them um, painters or otherwise um, cartoon creators. There's a lot of backlash there because AI can just get away with leveraging their these people content, right? So publishing summaries is a good way to control that. But there's also limited risk AI systems that should comply with minimal transparency requirements that would allow users to make informed decisions. After interacting with the applications, the user can then decide whether they want to continue using it. Users should be made aware when they are interacting with AI. This includes AI systems that generate or manipulate image, audio, or video content. For example, deepfakes. Also top of mind, there are some examples there of people already interacting with deepfakes. Of course, malicious actors are going to leverage that regardless of regulations, but if um, corporations are at least, at least utilizing it properly, people will be made aware that will reduce the likelihood and raise awareness of people around these techniques as well. So that's very important. So this here is very, uh, very important news here, a EU AI Act. Okay. Next piece of news. It's also related to AI security. This is MITRE's sensible regulatory framework for AI security. This here is a great piece of paper, uh, which summarizes uh, a lot of things that are related to AI security. Now, they don't, they don't go as far as the uh, AI Act, which I just went through in terms of proposing risk-based, but they propose a look into threats related to AI. So opening up the document, this here is the document. It's public, so you can just as well open it and download it. Now what they do that I really like is that they highlight AI threats and risks. So they just uh, propose uh, explanations for AI threats and risks and they explain um, when AI is a subsystem is an issue when AI human augmentation as a human augmentation is an issue and when AI using being used autonomously would be a risk and a threat. They then describe the regulatory approaches for each of these threats and risks and they go into details there uh, which is very fascinating and lastly they get to the proposed elements of a regulatory framework for AI security and this is the subject that I would like to bring our attention to at this point in time. Now I'm going to scroll down all the way down to that section because that's it right here, proposed elements of a regulatory framework for AI security. And I will get to this table. So this table highlights the three most critical for immediate action, right? So looking at AI vulnerabilities, AI threats and AI risks versus these types of AI. So they're proposing this model for uh, AI or AI providers to leverage this uh, in a good way to create regulations and considerations based on this model. They are going to go into details here around each one of these topics, uh, which from, uh, from our perspective, defense perspective, it's fascinating, right? So see the development of this framework uh, and participate of this part of the industry is something fascinating. So I highly recommend us read through this document for um, better understanding of what regulation makers should be looking at when they are thinking about regulating AI systems. Now, lastly, I want to leave us with the Forrester Wave for Enterprise Email Security. 
for Q2 2023. This came out in, on the June on the 11th of June, and they looked at uh, at 20 point point criteria versus the top vendors of this industry, evaluating them all against their own criteria, and they are providing us a look into how they compare and how they stack up. I find this fascinating as we can oftentimes have a better look at uh, the industry itself from uh, from this perspective. And one of the comments that they make here at the beginning of this, uh, this report is that we're entering this golden age of email security. They are stating that this is a mature environment or mature domain. A lot of vendors are reaching the, the very good point into their capabilities uh, and customers are leveraging good vendors uh, most of the time, right? They also state here that uh, the customers that they researched, they proposed a research to, which were 37 customer customers interviewed by this research, only two of these 37 were working with a single enterprise email security vendor. All the others were working with one or more, right? So think about that. Um, and according to this research, for these 35 customers, this approach of having multiple um, email security providers provides greater efficacy for them and peace of mind, right? And that is because, as you can see there, attackers continue their own innovations to compromise users. So this is quite fascinating to see as well. Oftentimes, we don't have that level of visibility uh, on the trenches, right? Now, what they also highlight in this report and I find fascinating is the recommendations of basic functionalities that uh, customers of these kind of technologies should be looking at. Right, so they highlight three topics here, which are offer flexibility in deployment and integrations. Um, so that's very that should be top of mind for customers. So being able to integrate via API, being able to be a proxy as well, that's important. Uh, being able to have advanced phishing and business email, business email compromise detection models is critical as well. They also state that the second aspect of that every customer should be looking at is make it easy for security teams to respond. Um, this has come a long way, especially with XDR platforms uh, being released on the market. A lot of major vendors are making their alerts um, and correlating their alerts already. And they state that every customer or every everyone should be thinking about that. They even use the term here, AX. Now, AX is a term that I've seen Forrester use before in which they state that this is the analyst experience, right? So we have user experience, but they're, uh, they're making a point here that we should make analyst use of their, of their own system, of these vendor systems better. This is the analyst experience. Improve that too. And lastly, the point they make is that we should look beyond delivering, uh, beyond email to deliver holistic human protection. Right, so they make a point here about the email just uh, being seen as the battle line that must be held. But as a result, vendors are investing in detection capabilities for sophisticated social engineering, cleverly embedded malware, and highly realistic landing pages for attacking campaigns. So everything we know very well from the from defense lines. So this, this capability to detect all, detect all of these uh, malicious techniques are necessary, right? But there are other fronts. So the use of messaging, collaboration, file sharing, and enterprise SaaS applications across multiple devices contribute to employee productivity and employee experience. So we need to cater for these employee experience as well while we look at um, going beyond email. That's essentially what they're saying, right? Um, they also state that awareness and training efforts must move beyond standard phishing testing and compliance checkbox courses to adaptive human protection like real-time nudges to encourage vigilance and secure handling of sensitive information. So this holistic human approach is something that goes way beyond just enterprise email security, right? It, it goes back to your entire cybersecurity program and how you're executing that with your users. Uh, and it will oftentimes, more than not, touch on different capabilities, different technologies, different um, products entirely, right? Um, 
now and they go to their evaluation summary which is owned by Forrester naturally and you can have a look in the uh, report itself so I will leave this report over to you as well okay hopefully this has been informative to you and this has given you a few insights into what happened in June uh, in the industry of course I haven't covered operational news or threats so if you do need that kind of content please re uh, reach out to other uh, content creators who are oftentimes reporting those in real time and there's just so much of that information that it really would take a lot more than the amount of time that it took this video here but hopefully you found these informative and helpful to you in the next coming months thank you